Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay. Good to have everybody back, and uh, I'll tell you what, I, I just can't believe the size of our class today. Kind of thrills my heart, and uh, again, for those of you watching on television, these people come from all sorts of backgrounds in various cities and towns around, and uh, we just come together for an informal Bible study. We don't have a big organization. We don't have any. In fact, it's just myself, and Iris picks up the phone orders and mails out the tapes and what have you, and Harold and Margaret are back there. They take care of the business end of it. And then Nancy back there, I don't know if the camera can get on you or not, Nancy, but Nancy does all the printing. She puts together all the order blanks for us, and uh, Nancy just does all the odds and ends. And uh, all of us, of course, do what we do for no compensation. Every dime that comes in we use for television time and book printing and what have you. So anyway, uh, we appreciate the letters. Oh, how we appreciate the letters from those of you out in television and uh, the response and how you're learning and seeing things you've never seen before. And of course, that's the only reason I teach is to help people to understand this book while they do their own study. Now, in this half hour, we're going to look at those 40 days of Christ in his post-resurrection. From the time he was raised from the dead until in Acts chapter 1, he ascends back to glory. Now, the only verse in Scripture that I know of where we have the time element would be in Acts chapter 1, and you drop down to verse 3. Now, in just a little while, we'll be going into the book of Acts in a verse by verse, but just for now, Acts chapter 1, verse 3 where it says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, in other words, the proof of his resurrection, being seen of them forty days. Now that's the only place we have in Scripture that uh, would cover that period of time from the resurrection until the ascension. And then, of course, it was ten more days until the day of Pentecost. But the infallible proofs, now, you know, if there's any one doctrine in Scripture that throws a curve at a lot of people, including preachers, it's the resurrection. Some may have problems with the virgin birth, but uh, maybe they can swallow that a little easier yet than the doctrine of his resurrection, that he arose from the dead bodily. Uh, I think this same Muslim that wrote, uh, that was one thing he couldn't comprehend. How can you teach that, that God walked around in the flesh? How can you teach that he arose from the dead and then walked around bodily? How can I? Because the book says it. And so here we have the infallible proofs. Now, there have been men who have gone out and almost given a lifetime to prove the fallacy of the resurrection of Christ. But after they dig into it, the more they see and the more they understand, they come away from it believers, invariably. And uh, the thing that I always have to look at, if I need proof and I don't, I would just look at Peter and these other ten men. How did they react when they first arrested Christ? What did they do? Why, they scattered like a bunch of quail. They were scared to death. What did Peter do? Denied him three times. Why? He was fearful for his own life. And that was typical. But after the resurrection, you don't see that kind of an attitude in Peter and the rest of the disciples. They're ready now to go to the very ends of persecution, knowing that no matter what happens to them physically, the power of the resurrection is still in our future. And so always remember that, that Peter especially, as we'll be going into the book of Acts, is a totally different person than he was leading up to the crucifixion. And why? 
because he had witnessed the power of Christ's resurrection. It was not a figment of somebody's imagination. It was real. All right, now just to show you how real, and that he arose from the dead bodily. I'm going to have you come back with me now to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. Now these are all verses I'm sure you're familiar with. We aren't going to be bringing out anything brand new, but hopefully we can bring it out in a way that it'll stick with you and that it'll reinforce your faith in some of the other things that are going to be <clears throat> coming down the pipe. Now in Luke 24, I guess we can just as well start at verse 13. Luke 24, beginning at verse 13. And behold, two of them who went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about threescore furlongs, five or six miles, and they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. Now you want to remember way back in uh, Christ's earthly ministry as they were up there in northern Israel at Caesarea Philippi at the head of waters of the Jordan River and Jesus said, we go up to Jerusalem Everything that has been written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished, and they'll scourge him, they'll beat him, they'll put him to death, and on the third day he'll rise again. And then you remember what the next verse says? And they, the twelve, understood none of these things because it was hid from them. Well, who hid it? God did. He didn't let them understand that he was about to be crucified. And that's why it's, it's so logical then to understand that those 12 men, the 11, we'll count Judas out now, but those 11 men had no idea he was going to die. And after he died, they had no idea he was going to be raised from the dead. In fact, what do they do? They go back to Galilee. It's all over. It's all done. And even as late as John's Gospel, chapter 20, when Peter and John ran to the sepulcher and they saw the evidence, they had to believe. And then the next verse says, For as yet they understood not the Scripture, that he must arise from the dead. And so always remember that God can do this. And you and I are living in a day where he has removed that blindness. We can believe it if we'll just want to. All right, so these two men from Emmaus then didn't even comprehend who Jesus was as he took up, stepping along with them. Verse 17, and then he said unto them, Jesus said to these two, what manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and you're sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? and hast not known the things which are come to pass in these days? And he said unto them, What things? Oh, he knew. But you see, Jesus always draws it out of people, you know, with a question. And they said concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, how the chief priests and the rulers delivered him, be condemned to death, and they've crucified him. We trusted, or we believed, that it had been he who should have been the one to redeem Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, who were early at the sepulcher. And then verse 25, just for sake of time. And then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded of them all the scriptures of the things concerning himself. The Old Testament was full of it. What did I say in the last half hour? Israel should have known. Israel could have known. The Old Testament was full of who he was and what would take place. But they didn't take the time to study. They didn't take the heart to really comprehend. And on top of that, of all things, I think God kept it from them. But anyway... Verse 29, in verse 28, they thought that he would continue on his way, and they constrained him, verse 29, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them, in other words, into their home. 
And it came to pass as he sat at meat, at food, I imagine the evening meal, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened. And that's something. And they knew him. And then he vanished out of their sight. Now you want to remember that we are so programmed to physics and chemistry as we understand it. And that is, of course, in our natural area. But you see, when we get into eternity, God's physics, God's chemistry is going to be so totally beyond anything that we know today. We can't comprehend, I can't, that everything material, wood, steel, everything, is comprised of atoms. And these little atoms have as much space between their particles that it's just like a solar system. Now, we can't comprehend that. There's all the space in the world within the atom. And when God puts that into the eternal state, we're not going to have any trouble slipping through a wall. I'll never forget my old chemistry professor. I'll have to put this on the board. The old chemistry professor, he put it this way. He said, now I'm going to make this dot just big enough so the people at the back row can see it. But he said, if I could let this dot represent the nucleus of an atom, then he said, the very first little particle in that outer orbit, those of you who know anything of physics and chemistry, he said that first little new, uh, electron in the inner orbit would be out here, and then he named a city that was 150 miles in the distance. Now that's the construction of an atom. And then you have the same thing in another orbit out here. And all of these things is open space. Now, of course, it's so minute that we can't comprehend all that, but comparatively, you've got all this empty space even in an atom. And so all of our material has that makeup. And so what I have to look at is now we get to the eternal, we're going to have something, I don't know how it's going to be, but you see, he vanished. He went right in, now read on. Uh, verse 33, they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them. And they said that the Lord is risen. And then verse 36, and as they doth, thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. Did he come in the door? No. Here he was. Bodily. Bodily. Not in a spirit, but in a flesh and bone, body. Now read on down, verse 38, And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do you, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, now watch this, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me. See, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not, what is it? flesh and bone. Now what's left out? Blood. So in our eternal state, we can probably rest assured that we're going to be bodily put together in flesh and bone, but without a blood circulatory system. All right. And so he has flesh and bones. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy, oh, they were tickled to death to see him, and yet that that stripe of unbelief is still sitting between them, and yet they, they just couldn't comprehend. And so he said in verse 41, Have you any meat? Have you any food? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and a honeycomb. Now look in verse 43. And he took it and did eat before them in that resurrected body. What was he proving? Oh, for all eternity, we're going to have a body that can still enjoy food. Now, those of you who love to eat, take heart. You're not going to have to worry about those pounds. You're going to be able to enjoy all these things without health problems, cholesterol, and what have you. But we're going to be able to enjoy food. Now, why do I say that? Now, hold this in your memory bank a moment. And let's go back first to the Old Testament, Zechariah, because a lot of people think, you know, that... 
just as soon as you get out of the Old Testament and the New that there's a great big wall between them. No, there isn't. They all fit together. Come back to the last, Zechariah, next to the last book in your Old Testament. Find Matthew and just go back through Malachi to the left. Go back through Malachi and you'll find Zechariah and come into chapter 12 and verse 10. Going backwards, Matthew, Malachi, Zechariah. Chapter 12, verse 10. And this, of course, will be at his second coming when he returns to this earth. He returns specifically to the nation of Israel. Zechariah 12, verse 10, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. They shall look upon me whom they have, what? Pierced. And how are they going to see it? With their eyes. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Now I turn the page in chapter 13, verse 6. Same, same book, Zechariah, chapter 13, verse 6. And remember now, this is Old Testament. This isn't New Testament, this is old. And the prophet writes, verse 6, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy, what? Hands. Does the Spirit have hands? Does the Spirit have feet? No. Granted, he is a spirit being, but he's bodily. And then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friend. So here you have a physical visible manifestation of his resurrection, even in the Old Testament. All right, now let's come back into the New. And let's go back and see what the old Apostle Paul has to say. 2 Corinthians, chapter 4. Second Corinthians, chapter 4. And drop down to verse 3 and 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Verse 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom, that is, in lost people, in whom the God of this world, that's a small g, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them who believe not. You see that? lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, now here it is, this is what I want you to see, lest the glorious gospel of Christ, who, speaking of Christ, is the image of whom? Of God. What's an image? It's the likeness. It's that which you can see and touch. Have you ever wondered why so much of the world is in idolatry and always has been? Because they want a God that they can see. They want a God that sits up there on the shelf and say, there's my God. Maybe they can touch him. They can fall down and worship him. They even get so foolish, you know, as to lay food in front of him. But the whole thing is, they've got to have a God that they can see. And see, this is the whole idea of Christ being manifested in the flesh. God knew that. And so he permitted himself to become visible, manifested in the flesh so that man could no longer say, well, I can't worship an invisible God. I have to have a God I can see. We do have a God that men have seen. We haven't. But there was a whole generation that did. Thousands of them did. Paul says even over 400 at one time saw him in his resurrection body. And so we have ample proof that he arose from the dead bodily and that he is the very same God that created you and I in the first place that went to the cross and purchased our redemption. But he didn't stay there. He's not dead tonight. He arose. He ascended. He's coming again. All right? And so Paul makes it so plain here that Christ is the image of God. All right, now let me take you back a little further to Colossians. Well, let's just stop at Philippians on the way through because I like to do it so that you don't have to come back and forth any more than necessary. But now in Philippians, chapter 3. 
Philippians chapter 3. Because all my land, I can remember, I guess, in my early years, I had no concept of our spending eternity in a body. I just thought we died and went to heaven, and after that I didn't know whether we strung a harp and uh, somehow in soul and spirit heard good music and so forth. I don't know what I knew. But I know now that when we get into the eternal state, we're going to be there bodily, because look what this verse says. Verse 20 and 21 of, the, of Philippians 3. For our conversation, that's citizenship, is in heaven already. If you're a believer tonight, you're already a citizen of heaven. From whence, that is from heaven, we also look for the Savior, not the king. You know, I always have to point that out to people. We're not looking for a king. He's not the king to the church. He's the Savior. He's the head of the body. And that makes a big difference. Paul never refers to Christ as the king of the church only as the Savior, the Redeemer, the head of the body. He's going to be the King of kings and Lord of lords, absolutely, but not for us, because we're never going to be his subjects. We're going to be his co-heir. makes a big difference. So anyway, verse 21. This Lord Jesus Christ of verse 20 shall change our vile, our corrupt, prone to death, prone to disease, prone to suffering, shall change our vile body, that it, this body, may be fashioned like unto his glorious what? Whose glorious body? Christ. See that? We're going to be made in the same likeness as his resurrected body. And that's why I pointed out that he sat down with the disciples and ate fish ate honeycomb, and yet he was in that eternal state where he went right through the wall, right through the ceiling. He can travel at the speed of light, and so will we. Oh, it's going to take no time to go from here to glory. That's not going to take long. It's going to be a split second almost, but whatever. And he's going to give us a body fashioned like on his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Ah, now I just happened to think of another verse. Wasn't intending to use it. I hope I got time. Yeah, I do. Romans. Come back to Romans. And then we'll go to my next one that I planned on. That would be in Colossians. But come back to Romans. Romans chapter 8. A portion of Scripture that I'm afraid very few people understand. Romans 8. Oh, I wish I had time to just read all of these from 18 on down, but, uh, oh, maybe I do. Let's read them quickly, otherwise it won't really make as much sense. Verse 18, where he says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now I'm in Romans 8, verse 18, now 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's you and I. For the creature was made subject to vanity, or all of creation, really, because of the curse. Not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in what? In hope. In other words, when God dropped the curse on the planet and on the human race, what did he immediately do? Made a plan of redemption to bring back to himself everything that he had lost. All right, verse 21, because the creature or creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together un now, until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, who have the first fruits in the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, that is to say, what? The redemption of our soul? No. Our what? Our body. See that? Yes, we're saved and we're redeemed in the area of the soul. I know that. But what are we going to be when we get to glory? A complete person. And according to 2 Thessalonians 5, what's the complete person? Soul, body, and spirit. And we're going to have all three in the eternal state. 
All right, now my next one. I said back to Colossians. Colossians, chapter 1. And then the next one, if you want to look ahead faster than what the rest of us do, go to Hebrews, chapter 1. Colossians, chapter 1. Drop down to verse 13. Now verse 12. Have to start where we can pick up the flow. Giving thanks unto the Father. Colossians 1, verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, who hath made us meet, or has prepared us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who, speaking of the Father, has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Absolutely. We're already citizens of that kingdom in whom we have redemption through his blood. Now, I don't think I have many of my classes that have newer translations, the NIV and the NASB and the living and all the rest, but if you do, you'll notice this isn't in your Bible because you see those new translations have gutted the scriptures, whether you know it or not. And so you don't have through his blood in your Bible. And I picked this up 20 some years ago. I'd be reading and someone would say, well, my Bible doesn't say that. It doesn't. No. Well, of course, now it's becoming evident that they have deleted thousands of words and verses from your new translations, and they have cut the meaning of so many others. It, it's just preposterous. And uh, so I told Iris the other day, I don't know now why the Lord kept me in the, oh, I do know now why, the Lord kept me in the King James all these years. I've never deviated from it. I don't have another version in my house, never have had, and as I've said on this program before, I, say, I don't have a library. Uh, this is the only library I've got. But anyway, here it is now. Only got 30 seconds. Verse 15. Who, speaking of the Son in verse 13, is the image, the likeness, physical appearance of the invisible God. That's what Christ is. He is the visible manifestation in the flesh, bodily, of the invisible God. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, Write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552.